Conference Centre Swanwick in Derbyshire and to our first lecturer in this uh, series of talks on the lights of Antioch. Um, the first saint we're going to consider, chronologically as it were, is the Hieromata and Godbearer St. Ignatius of Antioch. And our lecturer today is uh, Father Chrysostom, who is from the parish of St. Dunstan in Poole. Father, thank you very much. Christ is risen. He is risen. risen. In the early mid uh, 1970s, I studied theology at Bristol University. It was there that I first came across the martyr Ignatius of Antioch, the subject of this lecture. I can still recall a throwaway remark. At least I think it was a throwaway remark made by our professor, the professor of theology at the time at Bristol was Dr. the Reverend Kenneth Grayston. Professor Grayston was a minister of the Methodist Church as well, and had a degree in chemistry as well as theology. His specialism was New Testament studies. And in this particular lecture, which, if I recall, touched upon the sub-apostolic period in church history, he had just read to us a part of St. Ignatius' letter to the Romans. I am truly in earnest about dying for God. If only you yourselves put no obstacles in the way, I must implore you to do me no such untimely kindness. Pray leave me to be a meal for the beasts, for it is they who can provide my way to God. I am his wheat, ground fine by the lion's teeth, to be made purest bread for Christ. Our professor concluded this quotation with the seemingly off-the-cuff remark that, clearly, this man had a pronounced death wish. <laughs> Recalling this all these years later, I still to a degree think that my former professor was being deliberately mischievous in attempting to put this anachronistic and decidedly modern interpretation upon the saint's psychology. It is, of course, as a martyr that Saint Ignatius is primarily remembered. Indeed, he might be seen as the epitome of the martyr, so that it is his lasting influence upon Christ, the Christian concept of martyrdom that his real significance seems to lie. And it is with this idea that this lecture, at one level, is mainly concerned. But if we ask the deeper question, what relevance Ignatius' life and death has for the Orthodox Church, I should be very reluctant merely to see him, or any saint for that matter, as simply a worthy exemplar from our past. The significance of any of these saints we are considering during the days of this conference lies not so much in the past, in the meaning today of details of their lives, as in the fact of their sanctity, that we are members with them of the same body of Christ, that we sh they share with us on earth the communion which they enjoy with Christ God and with one another. Perhaps so, having for the purpose of this lecture gone back and reread Ignatius' letters once again, which I first did 40 years ago, it strikes me that Ignatius alive in Christ in the eternal now, is the same bishop, and it is as a bishop that through his preserved letters he still speaks to us, as any bishop witnessing to the kingdom in this contemporary town, time-bound world. Few details are known concerning Ignatius' actual life. Nothing is really known of his origins or early career. His surname, Theophoros, can be translated God-born, 
meaning carried, or God-bearer, the carrier. The latter meaning is generally favoured. It is just possible that it was a Christian name, literally taken at baptism. He was the bishop of the metropolitan see of Antioch in Syria, one of the greatest cities of the ancient world. <coughs> he held this position after the death of his predecessor, uh, Euodius, in AD 69, who in turn had succeeded the apostle St. Peter. For about 40 years, Ignatius held his episcopate, but his life might have proven even more obscure to us now had it not been for both his letters, together with the memory of his extraordinary martyrdom and its effects on the church through the centuries. He is thought to have died in the year 107 AD. This was during the reign of the Emperor Trajan. <clears throat> what Ignatius was charged with, we have no record. But some of you will be aware of the letters of his contemporary, a Latin writer, Pliny the Younger, who lived around 61 to 113 AD, <coughs> who was for a time Trajan's representative in Bithynia and Pontus on the Black Sea. In Pliny's famous letter number 96 in Book 10, he asks advice from the Emperor Trajan as to what he should do with these Christians. The Emperor's reply, was that he should not hunt them down, but if they were brought before him, they should be offered the opportunity to recant their belief and confirm it with sacrifices to the gods. <coughs> if they refused, they should suffer death. Pliny mentions that there were accused people who told him that they had given up their belief, even up to 20 <coughs> years before. They duly offered wine and incense to the pagan deities and reviled the name of Christ in Pliny's presence, and so saved their lives in this world, a fact that should remove any illusions about the quality of commitment among many in the early church. Many, of course, were possessed of a firmer faith. We may presume that Saint Ignatius was just such a recusant in the face of threatening paganism, faithful to Christ, even to the end, albeit he was, of course, in the province of Syria, quite some way south from Bithynia. At this point, I must confess that I am grateful uh, to the Dean for handing me the task of lecturing on my current subject and not my namesake, John Chrysostom. <laughs> this is not through any lack of interest on my part, you understand but rather in the size of the <coughs> research required. I have read a fair bit of my patron saint's writings, but the idea of reviewing most of it, when compared to the corpus of writings attributed to Ignatius, would be a Herculean labor which I am quite content to leave with Father Alexander. <laughs> <laughs> I do not intend here to go over the story of the authentication of the Ignatian epistles, save to say that most scholars now accept that there are seven clearly written by him. Up to the 15th century, there were said to be 15 letters by Ignatius. Controversy over the number and even the length raged on until Lightfoot settled the question once and for all in 1885. So that contemporary editions feature the seven we shall draw on today. The letters are written to the churches along St. Ignatius' route on his way to martyrdom at Rome. As he traveled, he, visited the he was visited by delegations representing these churches, and in return, he sends off the letters that we can still read to the churches of the Ephesians, Magnesians, the Trallians, the Romans, the Philadelphians, the Smyrnians, and a personal letter to his brother Bishop Polycarp, later to be martyred himself. Anyone who reads these letters will be repaid for ca by careful study, and what comes across clearly is the character of the man himself. 
What strikes the reader in the first place is his earnestness, his desire to complete his following of Christ by dying for the gospel. As his one fear is that Christians who might have influence with the Roman authorities will make unsolicited representations on his behalf in order to have his death sentence commuted. As he writes to the, to the Romans, what fills me with fear is your own kindly feeling for me and the disservice it may do me. What you are bent on doing will certainly present no difficulties for yourselves, but for me, it is going to be very hard to get to God unless you spare me your intervention. We may understand, you, we may understand my erstwhile professor's psychological analysis of Ignatius' intent, but fully to understand his motivation requires something deeper. It is not so much <coughs> his psychology, but his spirituality that is at work here. Indeed, it is a great part of the saint's legacy to have influenced the subsequent Christian understanding of martyrdom. In part, he sees his coming death as literally bearing, bearing witness, as the word uh, martyr means in Greek to witness, witnessing to his apostolic faith in asserting the fact of Christ's historical and physical reaction in his incarnation, of his real death and rising again, he poses the question to the Trallians, if this is not so, why am I now a prisoner? Why am I praying for combat with the lions? For in that case, I am giving away my life for nothing, and all things I have ever said about the Lord are untruths. This then is no psychopathology. This is rooted in faith and a firm belief that in taking up the way of the cross, he has found the path of his salvation. I am yearning for death with all the passion of a lover, he tells the Romans. Earthly longings have been crucified in me, there is left no spark of desire for mundane things, but only a murmur of living water that whispers within, come to the Father. In other words, we have in these letters, perhaps, the earliest reference we possess outside the New Testament to the Christian understanding of the paradox that through our sufferings, we are united with the God who suffered for us. To what end have I given myself up to perish by fire or sword or savage beasts? Ignatius asks the Smyrnians, simply because when I am close to the sword, I am close to God, and when I am surrounded by the lions, I am surrounded by God. It is but it is only in the name of Jesus Christ and for the sake of sharing his sufferings that I could face all this, for he, the perfect man, gives me strength to do so. Moving on now from Ignatius' spiritual ambition and goal <coughs> to martyrdom, we must address the theological value of the letters. Apart from his perception of the glory of being a witness for Christ, he presents two other areas of great significance. Again, outside the New Testament, we have here the first <coughs> reference to the dignity and importance of the sacred ministry, especially that of the Episcopal office. For Ignatius, the local bishop is the guarantor and embodiment of the Church's unity. Nothing in ecclesiastical life should be undertaking without the bishop's blessing. As children of the light of truth, therefore, he writes to the Philadelphians, see that you hold aloof from all disunion and misguided teaching, and where your bishop is, there follow him like sheep. He even instructs Polycarp that Christians intending to marry should have the bishop's consent 
in order that their union may be in tribute to the Lord. This, incidentally, is very interesting in that although we have no evidence of a sacramental form of marriage from this time, we clearly have here a developed understanding within the church of marriage, like martyrdom, as a vocation, a way of witnessing to Christ. Ignatius evidently <coughs> takes this high view of episcopacy in part for very practical reasons. His great concern is for unity, and the bishop, as the leader of the local church, is the obvious anchor for anyone wishing to be in Christ. To be out of step with one's bishop is to wander into schism and risk heresy. These high ideas have, since the Reformation in the West, fed the old dispute between established Episcopal church government and Presbyterianism. Is the threefold form of the sacred ministry, of the essay of the church, part of her essence? Or is it just for the bene essay, her well-being? In the pastoral <coughs> epistles of the New Testament, there is as yet no clear distinction between the, Epis the Episcopal and Presbyteral offices. But we need to remember that the parish priest, even today, is essentially deputizing for the bishop and stands, it, stands aside when the bishop is present and, moreover, only serves the liturgy with the antimensium signed by the bishop lying upon the holy table. So I would suggest that the, there is a non-issue here. Ignatius stresses the pivotal role of the clerical body as a whole, which in turn feeds perfectly into the Orthodox Christian conception of the priest as being the icon of Christ, the symbol of the heavenly bridegroom at the mystical supper. The fact that there is no clear assertion by Ignatius of a later high sacerdotal doctrine of the ministry, as is found, for example, in the medieval West, cannot surprise us and certainly should not alarm us. The saint was not writing to the recipients of, of his letters any systematic theology, but was very, pra but very practical direction on how to, how to live the ecclesiastical life in Christ. Ignatius' other great concern in his letters is the maintenance of Christian <laughs> orthodoxy itself. The problem he faced in Antioch itself was a local church coming under the influence of two different, we would say heretical, conceptions of what Christianity actually is. Whilst in the middle was Ignatius and his congregation proclaiming and teaching what he, and indeed we, would call the Orthodox Catholic faith. The first of these was Judaism, or rather the, Ju the Judaizers, so that it is evident that the Council of Jerusalem, written about in the Acts of the Apostles, chapter 15, <coughs> although authoritative in its judgments, did not solve the issue once and for all. We find St. Ignatius in his letter to the Philadelphians, writing that although Christians reverence the Old Testament prophets, since they too proclaim the gospel in their preaching and set their hopes on him, they should not listen to anyone who makes use of them to expand Judaism to them. St. Paul had confronted St. Peter over this, as he writes in his epistle to the Galatians, and although by Ignatius' time they were not promoting Jewish circumcision as necessary to salvation, there were clearly elements of the old dispensation and its practices that they wished to hang on to, being unable to accept the radical change brought about by the new dispensation in Christ. His own city of Antioch had a sizable Jewish community, larger than any other city of Asia, and its influence must still have been there into the 4th century, albeit for a smaller community, as witnessed by St. John Chrysostom's tirades against dallying with Jewish practices. 
The second attack came from a religious philosophical system called Docetism. The term comes from the Greek dokesis, meaning appearance. It developed under the influence of Greek and Oriental philosophical ideas, which regarded all material, materially created things as morally inferior, of little value, or even the creation of an evil demiurge. From this perspective, docetic thinking regarded the concept of the incarnation of God as repulsive, a true scandalon, which could not accept the idea of any intercourse between the transcendent holy and the imminently physical. For the docetists, Christ only appeared on earth, but had no physical substance or reality. All his actions, including his death and resurrection, were intended illusions. As you can imagine, St. Ignatius attacks this notion with all his fervor. Once again, St. Paul had faced the same assaults on the apostolic kerygma or proclamation, fully aware, as he writes to the Corinthians, that the gospel was folly to the Greeks and a stumbling block to the Jews. It is therefore no surprise that much the same heretical tendencies were still around at the end of the first century and even beyond. Docetism had begun as an attempt to reconcile religious and philosophical thought. An early form associated with Christianity is associated with the teachings of Corinthus and appears to be the object of attack and correction in the Johannine epistles. This suggested that God's spirit entered Jesus at his baptism and departed just before his crucifixion. Interestingly, a garbled version of this, this later on enters into Islam and becomes part of its general misunderstanding of what Christianity actually teaches. Ignatius, of course, has no patience with the idea that he confronts, namely that the whole of Christ's life is a semblance of reality, a mere phantom, in order to avoid the mixing of spirit and matter. In his letter to the Smyrnians, he writes, for my own part, I know and believe he was in actual human flesh even after his resurrection. When he appeared to Peter and his companions, he said to them, take hold of me, touch me, and see that I am no bodiless phantom. Perhaps Ignatius has in mind here the appearance of Christ at the end of St. Luke's Gospel, chapter 24, verse 36, following. Or, he's he is passing on what he had received in the tradition, or indeed both, of course. Whatever the case, he makes the point <coughs> that this physical rea reality of Christ in the flesh had its effects on the apostles, for they had contact with the flesh and blood reality of him, he continues. That is how they came by their contempt for death and proved themselves superior to it. Moreover, he ate and drank with them after he was risen. Like any natural man, though even then he and the Father were spiritually one. It is clear from all this that for Ignatius, what really mattered was not only that salvation depended on knowing and believing the <coughs> true gospel, but that communion and fellowship Kinonia depended on being in harmony with the bishop. This is a constant theme throughout his letters. Though this might seem obvious to us 2,000 years after 2,000 years of church life, we have to bear in mind that Ignatius did not have a formally ratified creedal document with conciliar authority behind it. There was as yet no universally agreed canon of the Holy <coughs> Scripture, only no holy canons to mark the boundaries of ecclesial life and practice. Yet it is precisely people like St. Ignatius 
standing within the authentic succession of the apostles who were forming and articulating what we now know as, the, as, an, as Orthodox Catholic Christianity. It would therefore be tempting to view the importance of saints like Ignatius purely in terms of a process, that is, as in a kind of relay race where the early saints handed on the baton to later generations and we in turn must pass it on. That is true, of course, but I think it must be more than that. For the one holy Catholic apostolic church of Jesus Christ is not in essence a religious institution. It is not a function to be analyzed by sociologists and anthropologists, though that be possible at one level. St. Ignatius' importance for us is found precisely in our communion <coughs> with him among the saints of God, that we hold the same faith, that we live in the self-same holy tradition, and that we are at one with our own bishop, who follows in the same apostolic succession. But even more than this, it is the example of Ignatius' own faith that should capture our attention, not just in terms of particular beliefs, that he, but that he was utterly convinced of their saving power, inasmuch as he was spendthrift with his own life. In other words, it was by his martyrdom, even in the face of wild animals with their teeth and claws, that proved that he, as we might say, put his money where his mouth was. We might also dare to suggest that it is the kind of faith that passes into knowledge. Polycarp, similarly, as Saint Irenaeus of Lyon tells us, when he was younger, knew the Apostle John himself. That generation had actual contact with those who had known Christ in the flesh. The implication is that either, on the one hand, the Twelve and the Seventy indeed, were engaged in the greatest deluding conspiracy in history, in which case, why would they in their turn suffer martyrdom for such a false idea? Or, on the other hand, what they proclaimed is what we believe, the truth as it is in Christ Jesus. Herein lies, I think, the importance of Saint Ignatius, in that we stand with him in the same truth. It will be later theologians, like Blessed Augustine of Hippo, who will develop Christian thinking on martyrdom, especially after the period when the early persecutions had come to an end with the triumph of Constantine the Great. For Augustine, martyrdom, in its inner meaning of bearing witness to Christ, could be understood in various shades, the red martyrdom of dying for Christ, the white martyrdom of the monastic life, the green martyrdom of married life, the violet martyrdom of widowhood. But for Ignatius, the issue was much more stark. Do you believe the gospel? Are you prepared to lose everything in this life for Christ's sake? There were, of course, plenty in his day and in his own city who fled from that call to witness. We are not immediately faced with that demand, and we pray daily, lead us not into temptation, for deliverance from the time of testing. Yet we live in the same household of God, one Lord, one faith, one baptism, and must find our own way of witnessing to Christ. In his letter to the Magnesians, Ignatius writes concerning the deacon Zotion. I should be happy in that man's company. He is as deferential to his bishop as he is to the grace of God. And we too, who live within the same Antiochian patrimony, can rejoice in the company of St. Ignatius, one of our own, who far from wallowing in a death wish, 
according to the speculations of my erstwhile professor, had in fact found the way of life. And it seems fitting that this lecture draw to a close with the traparium with which he is honored in all the churches. By choosing the apostles' way of life, who succeeded to their throne, inspired by God, you found the way to divine contemplation through the practice of virtue. After teaching the word of truth without error, you defended the faith to the very shedding of your blood. O holy martyr among the bishops, Ignatius, entreat the Lord our God to save our souls. Thank you, Father. Because we were running, are running 15 minutes late, we have five minutes for initial questions now, Father, mm -hmm. and I suggest that we go down for coffee at the appointed time at quarter to 11, and uh, then we resume after coffee uh, with another quarter of an hour before we proceed with the next lecture. We have a flexible time before lunch, okay? So we just have five minutes now, perhaps time for one or maybe two questions, and I intend that we uh, uh, record all of this, okay? Mm -hmm. Uh, unless you prefer not to uh, have that happen. Are we okay with that? Yeah. Okay. Um, do we have a comment or a question before we come to coffee? Yes, just one moment, please. And I'm going to come down and ask you to speak up, but actually I'm going to hold it in front of you, so it should be okay. But speak to the whole group, please. At the end of your talk, you give an image, kind of an image, of colour, of matter, than the colour of matter, than could you further explain that, please? It's an idea I've found in uh, Augustine of Hippo, in fact. He, he, we have to remember martyrdom essentially is not just dying for your faith. There's various debased forms of it. I mean, if you think of it, I mean, it's, it's used, the word great, used a great deal. <coughs> Anyone who, who, who dies, for example, in Islam as a Muslim in some sort of conflict. Now, to our mind, that is with all due respect, nonsense. But I, I think, for, for us, the, the essential thing about martyrdom is that it, it is that Greek word, witnessing. It's what, whenever you are witnessing to anything, you are there to, witnessing to Christ, you are a martyr. Not in the suffering sense, necessarily. So that all forms of Christian life which are blessed by God, particularly, as, as Augustine says, uh, marriage, widow, remaining as a widow, or the monastic life, are forms of martyrdom. They all have, of course, their, 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 their aspects of suffering involved in them in some sense, alongside dying and shedding blood, um, or as being, a, in that term, being a confessor of the faith, a, a passion bearer, suffering but not uh, a dying for the faith, um, maybe. Uh, they also are witnessing, and Ignat um, Augustine gives them these colors, their symbolic colors, like, the green and marriage, I suppose, because he's thinking of the new life that marriage produces children, um, and the, the, the violet of, of, um, of widowhood, of the, of, the, of the life spent in, not in, in hopeless mourning, but in, in the acceptance of the grief and looking forward to the kingdom of heaven. And of course, the, the, the role of the, of the widow as being a, uh, an intercessor or being a um, um, giver of hospitality in the ancient world, if not now. Um, and obviously the monastic life, the white martyrdom, the, as if, uh, I think it's St. Basil who describes monks as men living on, li in, on the earth as angels. So it's the angelic life already in this world, a witness to the angelic life of heaven. And of course, essentially, the, the shedding of your blood, the red martyrdom. So I think that's why he chooses those, those colours. Okay, I'll now draw this to a temporary close. We'll now go down for our coffee. I'll be staying here, perhaps with one or two others who want to still look at our bookstores, but we reconvene after coffee with yet more questions for Father Chrysostom. Christ is risen. He is risen. He is risen. He is risen. He is risen.